Imagine you have a few days break or a long weekend coming up. You're looking for ideas to code something. Please don't follow another machine learning tutorial trying to classify the petals of a flower that you don't even know the names of. Or don't pull your hair out trying to distinguish a cupcake from a chihuahua because your deep learning algorithm cannot figure that out. Instead, consider the classic problem of ray tracing. It is both challenging and fun. Plus, you can create cool images like this that can impress your friends. Most ray tracers are written in C or C++, but we will be creating this ray tracer from scratch using Python and its standard libraries only, not even using NumPy. Now you might be wondering, can such a plain vanilla Python program create high quality ray traced images before the heat death of this universe? Let's find out. Spoiler alert, it does. Hi, I'm Arun. Have you seen this Minecraft mod where everything is ray traced? Just notice how the light bounces off those blocks. Different colored lights have created reflections and they are rendered so beautifully that you don't even recognize that this is Minecraft. Real-time ray tracing is a hot topic right now. Many games that you are playing might partially or fully support ray tracing in the future. What we are going to do in this tutorial is not real-time ray tracing, but many of its concepts form the basis for real-time. We are trying to build a simple ray tracer which will render an image in probably minutes or seconds or how much of time it requires. But before we start, let's answer some Q and A's, questions nobody asked. There are a lot of tutorials targeting Python beginners, but a lot of people ask me if there is a good intermediate level tutorial for a mini project or tackling some problem, then this is for you. Even if you're not interested in Python, you might learn a lot of ray tracing concepts and you can implement your own ray tracer in your favorite language. You will need some basic knowledge of maths, but don't be scared. It would be easy and simple to follow. I promise. You will learn how to do a complete Python project of the intermediate level, starting from design to testing to optimization. We will use the Python standard library to solve various problems like generating images, parsing scenes, using all the cores or parallel processing, or even making cool progress bars. We will follow a unique problem-based approach. What a conveniently timed question. Rather than record my screen trying to find a solution, which would be a bit boring, I would like you to participate when I'm trying to solve the solution. Ray tracing is a complex project, so I'll try to break it down into various sub-problems. Every sub-problem will start with a set of requirements. I'll take you through what the requirements are, how you can solve this problem using different ideas, and possibly show you a teaser of what the output should look like. Then we will pause so that you get an opportunity to try solving the solution yourself. Next, you can continue the video and you can watch me how I solve the problem. Now you can compare it with your solution or follow along. Your focus is not on making some code that works somehow. We are trying to follow Python best practices to create some clean code. Many months of effort has gone into making this particular project. So you can imagine that a lot of thought has gone into the code that you will be seeing. Ray tracing, as you must have guessed by now, is an algorithm to create realistic computer graphics. 
Why does it look so real? It works very similar to how you see any object. If you are looking at a ball, then your eye can see it because light rays travel from a light source like a bulb. The ball bounced some of those light rays towards your eyes and the ball became visible. Imagine if there was no light. Oops, let's turn the lights back on. A bulb emits light in all directions. Only a small number of them reaches the eye. An algorithm which calculates the path of all rays would be wasteful and slow. Ray tracing algorithm uses all these concepts. But the smart thing it does is that it follows the path of the rays backwards. That is from your eyes to the light source. This way, only the visible rays are calculated. Now, let me introduce the computer screen through which we are looking at the scene. The screen is made of pixels. The algorithm needs to calculate the path of a ray starting from our eye, going through a pixel and reaching the scene. Now, one of several things could happen. One, the ray might hit the nearest object like a ball. The surface of the ball might be slightly reflective and acts like a mirror. We calculate the reflected ray and follow its path. This may reach the light source. If it does, then we know that we can see the ball through that pixel. Two, the reflected ray might not directly reach the light source. It might take a couple of more bounces to reach the light. Then we can see the reflection of other objects like a flow that reflects the ball on it. Three, the reflected ray might never reach any light source. Then we are looking at a shadow region. In this way, we can go pixel by pixel until a fully ray traced image is formed. So I use an editor called Emacs. If you're familiar with uh, other Python editors like PyCharm, VS Code, uh, Notepad++, uh, Emacs might look quite unfamiliar. So I'm just taking you a quick tour through the editor, just enough so that you can follow along. First, I'll show you how I open a file. I just press Ctrl X, Ctrl F. You can see at the bottom, it asks you for the file. Uh, I'm just going to enter a path to my readme file. This readme file uh, is empty right now. So I'm just going to type something like this is a readme, readme file. Uh, and I'm just going to save it by saying Ctrl X, Ctrl S. So you can see at the bottom that it says that it wrote the file. If I open uh, another file, instead of typing an entire file, uh, if I just press enter at the directory, it will show me the directory in this fashion. So it will show me the current directory contents. Uh, if you are familiar with Unix, this is kind of the output that you would see from an ls command. Or if you are from Windows, it is like the dir command if you are in the command prompt on the terminal. Uh, I can go up to any file and press enter to open it or I can just uh, tab, press tab and open uh, a, a subdirectory uh, and if I press tab again it folds back in. Now uh, I want to just create a simple Python program to show you some of the Python capabilities. Let me delete that placeholder. I'm just going to import a platform. Uh, I'm trying to print the version of Win, uh, Python that I'm running on. So I'll just say Python version is and use a format string. I'll just call format. You can see there is some sort of an auto completion happening here. Uh, if I just open the brackets and if you look down, you can see that the doc string or the arguments which are relevant for format are shown. Uh, which is always helpful if you forget what the first argument is, uh, second argument is, for instance. Uh, so here I'm just going to uh, take the output from a, a, a function within platform module. Uh, it's called platform dot python underscore version. So again, uh, you can see some sort of an auto completion happening here. Now you might not see auto completion for Python version uh, for some reason. If that is the case, I press Ctrl C, Ctrl D, 
uh, the documentation comes from the uh, doc string i believe for that particular uh, module uh, now i'll just save this file and i'll try to run this file uh, i can run this file from within emacs i just use alt x shell and uh, you can see that a shell has appeared at the bottom window uh, i'm just gonna go there and type uh, the python command uh, sorry um, and just go to the other window and type the python command uh, python main.py and you can see that it has executed that and shows the version uh, one last thing uh, i want to talk to you about is the automatic formatting which happens if i make a uh, if I format something, some line in a weird fashion, for instance, I press it like this or like this, it is still valid Python code. But when I save, uh, it gets auto reformatted, automatically formatted uh, using the black plugin. And uh, you might see uh, some sort of uh, squiggly line. I don't know if I can show you that here. Uh, yeah, so this squiggly line actually make, make, makes makes uh, an underline when uh, it fails the Python linting. That means that, uh, you know, it's kind of like a syntax check. It says that there is no white space around the operator. Uh, so if I put space around it, it might stop complaining about that. But then again, it says it's a syntax error. So this is some sort of a, you know, syntax check that happens. And you can see that when I say it, it auto reformats. So uh, if you are uh, if you have understood these things, I think you can pretty much follow along this tutorial. Okay, we are ready to talk about our first sub problem. Any ray tracer would require representation of objects in 3D space. So uh, the simplest object that we can represent is a point. We'll start with a very simple point in three dimensional space. So what is the requirement? The requirement is to represent vectors. Now, the real term vector actually means a line segment, something that has a head and a tail, similar to what you would think of an arrow, as you can see in this diagram. So the vector represented here is a blue line, the blue arrow over here. It's running from point A at the very zero point, uh, at the zero origin, to the point B, uh, which is located at uh, the fourth column and the third uh, row. Uh, in maths, we represent this as the x-axis and the vertical line is the y-axis. So this is at x coordinate 4 and y coordinate 3. Now, this is a two-dimensional vector. Clearly, this is uh, only showing the x and y-axis. If it's a three-dimensional object, it will have a third axis, which is the z-axis, which will actually go through you, uh, through the screen, sorry, uh, towards you uh, or away from you. So imagine if this is a three-dimensional space, there is an another axis, Z, which is going through it. And uh, for a ray tracer, since it's three-dimensional objects, we are interested in X, Y, and Z. Now, the requirement also continues here to say that we need to, we need to support certain operations for this vector. So when I say operations, uh, think of vector as something like a number, like uh, a number in the sense of a Python integer or a Python number. Python numbers can could be added, subtracted, multiplied, raised to the power of, etc. Same thing with other data types in Python like strings. The strings also, you can add strings, which means they will be concatenated one behind the other. Uh, you can also multiply strings with a number, which means they'll be repeated that many number of times. Similarly, if you think about a vector, uh, a vector represents a point in space. So uh, which point are we talking about here? I'm actually talking about the point B here. So uh, a vector usually connects a point to an another point uh, in mathematics. But in this particular requirement, when I say vector, I'm most often starting from the point zero, which is the origin. So A is usually fixed at zero and B is the point, the real point that we are discussing here. So uh, it's actually a three dimensional point, which we represent here as a vector. In a uh, 
In the case of vector, the operations that we need to support are quite straightforward. Uh, we need to see the length of a vector. In mathematical terms, we call this as the magnitude. So coming back to our earlier example, uh, if this particular point uh, was in x coordinate 0 and y coordinate 3, the distance from origin to this point can be measured by simple Pythagoras theorem. If you remember the right angled triangles which have one side 3 and another side 4, you'll remember that the longer side will usually be 5, which is nothing but 4 square plus 3 square square root. So in this case, the magnitude is 5, which we found out by calculating the squares of the individual sides and their overall square root. Same case, same principles apply for a three-dimensional vector as well. In this example, I'm using a three-dimensional vector uh, which has x coordinate 1, y coordinate minus 2, and the z coordinate of minus 2. And the magnitude, uh, in mathematics, we use these double vertical lines on either sides to represent magnitude. So um, the uh, I think it's called the absolute value. So the absolute value of v can be calculated as the square root over x square, y square, and z square. So that will be 1 square, 2 square, and 2 square, which, not, uh, which adds up to uh, 1 plus 4 plus 4, which is 9. The square root is 3. So the distance from origin to this particular point in three-dimensional space is 3. And that is one operation that we want our class to be implemented. When we come, uh, when we come to solutions, we'll see different ways of implementing. Now, uh, the other requirement is the normalize operator. Sometimes you're not interested in the entire vector. We're only interested in the direction the vector is pointing at. So uh, in three dimensional space, if imagine we want to show the direction of light, which is passing or which is hitting an object. In that case, we are really not considering, we're not really interested in how far the object was from point A to point B, etc. We're just interested in how the light is hitting the object, where, which direction it, it is going through. So when we normalize, what happens is the, the magnitude or the length of the vector is always the same. It's always one unit and the direction is the same as the direction of the original vector. Uh, the way in which we calculate the normalized form of a vector is quite simple. We divide the vector by the length of the vector so that it becomes one. Now, the representation for a normalized vector is something like this with like a hat on top. I think it's called V cap or V hat. So I call it V cap. So uh, V cap is equal to V divided by the magnitude of V. Uh, if V was one minus two minus two, it will be divided by three and you'll get these fraction, uh, repeated decimals 0.33 minus 0.667 minus 0.667 etc. So this becomes the normalized form of V. Uh, another important operation between two different vectors is called the dot product. Now dot product might sound complex is actually very easy to understand dot product is uh, the multiplication of uh, each component of a vector and then adding them together and finding their square root. Uh, if we have two vectors, one minus two minus two, three, six, nine, the dot product is one multiplied by three plus minus two multiplied by six plus minus two multiplied by nine and their square root. So it's basically, uh, one by one, you're multiplying them, adding them, and finding the square root. In this case, square root should come to minus 27. Uh, the reason I have given specific examples is that we'll use these examples in writing our test cases. So uh, we'll use probably the exact same examples in our test cases. Uh, followed by the final set of operations, which are the Pretty straightforward operations that you would expect vectors to follow, which is addition, subtraction, uh, multiplication, and division. Uh, addition is nothing but as you would expect, uh, adding each a component. Um, if it is x, you add the x together. So one plus three is four, 
minus 2 plus 6 is 4 and uh, minus 2 plus 9 is 7 and subtraction is uh, again you know 1 minus 3 minus 2 minus 6 etc so each component gets uh, subtracted the from the second component subtracted from the first components multiplication is a little more interesting so uh, notice that i am not multiplying a vector with another vector i am multiplying a vector with a with a normal number so what happens here is as you would expect each number is multiplied by that uh, second number uh, each component is multiplied by that second number we will not have a multiplication operator between two vectors because that's a different kind of operation called cross multiplication and in the case of ray traces we do not require it so uh, we are only we are only discussing the operators which are relevant for our ray tracing project so uh, if it's two vectors we usually do a dot product uh, but if it's a vector and a number uh, it's a straightforward multiplication with its components similarly uh, the case with division uh, when we divide a number from a vector we are basically dividing each component by that particular number so these are the basic operations that i want you to support uh, you can implement the vector in any way you like um, and i'll explain i'll compare the different um, implementations but they should support these operations now it's your turn to code yourself and try yourself why don't you uh, take about uh, you, why don't you pause this video right now and try to figure this out yourself uh, and then we'll talk about the solution so i hope you have tried your hand at the solutions and uh, you have some idea of what we need to do here so let me try and show you what my solution looks like. Before I think about how to code the solution, I usually think about what data structure needs to be implemented or used for representing uh, the data I need to represent. Uh, this is quite important to think in the early stages of a project because later it becomes very difficult to change uh, the data much more much more so than the uh, code itself so in the case of the vector class let's look at what different data structures we have available and since python is rich with various kinds of data structures uh, both within the language itself as well as from different third party modules uh, or libraries uh, we can think about various ways in which uh, we would have implemented a vector class um, you can think of a list uh, with three elements so this means that the list will have uh, say the x y and z as the first second and third or the zeroth index first index and the second index uh, same way with tuples uh, with three elements now uh, the difference between uh, using a list and a tuple in this case is tuples are immutable so it's slightly less flexible uh, you cannot uh, you know uh, do an in place change uh, when it comes to uh, manipulating some of the x or y or z coordinates so uh, which makes tuples slightly less uh, attractive than lists uh, the third option is a numpy array with three elements um, numpy uh, comes with a number of optimized data structures and array is one of them uh, which not only packs elements very tightly uh, but also very efficient to access and very performant um, same way as lists you cannot access them as uh, by their names like their field names you probably have to access them by an index like 0 1 2 etc now uh, those are the name nameless i would call it uh, representations but the fourth one the name tuple allows you to use a name uh, to access these fields as x y and z uh, the four the next one is a dictionary or a hash table where you can access individual elements as x y and z uh, in this case you might have to use a string as a key say for example a string x 
uh, within quotes might um, give you the result of what's uh, stored in X a coordinate, uh, return it as a number for instance, and so on. Uh, and the final option, uh, or uh, among the many options, the most uh, 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 the final option you might want to consider is that of a class uh, where you can define uh, fields or members um, of a class uh, X, Y, and Z, and you can store these numbers directly in those places. Uh, as you can see, there are uh, no right or wrong answers here, right? Uh, you can build uh, a ray tracer using any one of these data structures and it will still work. It's not that it will not work. But we are just looking and comparing these data structures in terms of which would be a more elegant uh, solution, which would be more clean from a coding point of view and, um, you know, uh, which would be more suitable for the type of problem that we are solving here. So the first two solutions, the first two representations do not allow you to access X and Y fields. Um, as you implement a ray tracer, you might have to do that a lot. You have to access either the Y coordinate or the X coordinate and calling them uh, the first element then the second element and the third element and so on becomes tedious after a while. It looks like you're making a lot of uh, lookups um, based on the num uh, the index and it becomes difficult to remember whether you're referring to x y or z coordinate so that makes it uh, less attractive for me um the second uh, the next one uh, or the third option which is numpy uh, uh, is kind of eliminated by our uh, decision quite early not to use anything outside the python standard library not to use any other third party libraries um, numpy is an excellent library and very performant used in many python ray tracers but we are trying to restrict our implementation to using only the python standard library uh, because we want to be uh, more creative with what we can achieve using what with what comes with the language with what comes with the standard python distribution uh, and this might be like a restriction, but a good restriction always allows us to come up with creative solutions. So we'll try to make uh, most use of this restriction. Um, the next is using dictionaries, using X, Y, Z fields. Um, so there's a, a very close uh, association between the way a dictionary works and a class works. Uh, both kind of performs a dictionary like or a hash table like lookup an O1 lookup um, in in Python the way it's implemented. But I would rather prefer to use a class because of operator overloading. In fact, I would use a class compared to any one of these representations because of operator overloading uh, or method overloading or um, dunder methods. Uh, as they call it. Uh, basically, if you want to add two classes or two custom uh, classes together, um, you, you, you can uh, perform those operations. And uh, as we saw in our requirements, we have a number of operations. If you were to use a dictionary, uh, we would have to create a separate function for each of them and call them um, with argument one being the first vector and the argument two being the second vector. Whereas if it is a class and we have overloaded the addition operator, we can just simply write, uh, you know, uh, vector one plus vector two, that's it. And the appropriate method would be called for that particular class. So <clears throat> this is what uh, I would finally go with. I would look, go with the last option, which is using a class with X, Y, and Z fields and using the method overloading for implementing all our vector operations. Okay, let's start coding our ray tracer uh, with the first sub problem. Now you can see that uh, I've created an empty project, an empty folder called puree. Uh, and uh, puree means pure uh, Python ray tracer ba basically. Uh, and we are going to follow an approach called uh, test driven development or TDD that some of you might be aware of. We'll first write the tests even before we write the implementation, the test will definitely fail. 
and then we write the implementation or code the um, actual um, implementation of the vector class and then keep running the test until the test pass so uh, this will show you illustrate how test driven development works as well as a good starting point on uh, how we can match our uh, very well defined specifications to our actual code so that there is very little gap between what was specified and what we are coding so let's go back to our specifications our requirements uh, i'd like to implement magnitude uh, and the dot product operations so uh, a dot product uh, basically has some similarity with uh, our magnitude uh, which might not be um, immediately apparent but what you're seeing inside of a magnitude which is basically squares added together can be done by multiplying or doing a dot product of this vector with itself um, if you mul if you think of v1 and v2 as the same vector then all these are squares right a1 multiplied by a1 a2 multiplied by a2 and a3 multiplied by a3 and then you are just a square root away from calculating the magnitude so uh, as uh, as we are implementing we would like to reduce the amount of code we write and reuse as much as possible so i'm going to implement uh, magnitude and dot product first and try to reuse as much as possible here so let's start by writing the test let's start by import unit test and then um, create a class called test vectors unit test dot test case now um, I can write um, all the common data or um, instances of objects which i'm using across test cases in a, a method called setup so i'm going to define setup and create our two uh, vectors so let me define setup and uh, our first vector would be called vector 1.0 minus 2.0 minus 2.0 uh, we have not created vector so far but let's assume that vector is inside a file called vector in small letters so from vector import vector we'll save that and uh, We'll write a simple test case which calculates the magnitude. We'll call it test magnitude self. And we'll say that if you're calculating the magnitude of this, uh, how much it should be. So it should be self assert equal self dot v1 dot magnitude. Assume it's a function should be let's see how much it should be so um if you go back my one minus two minus two should have been three so we'll make it three and save it now let's run um this uh, particular test case so uh, it's easier if we already define a main function here uh, and it's easy to do that you just have to say if name equals main and call unit test main so that's a built-in uh, main function for all unit testing purposes um, I'm going to run this test not by you can see that there is no module named vector so in test driven development we are driven by errors and the easy way to uh, and usually they say that you should do the smallest possible step 
to uh, rectify an error. So here it's very straightforward. You just need to create a vector dot by which has a class vector, which is which could be empty and save it and then run it. Right. This might feel like, uh, you know, cheating a bit, but this is pre pretty much what test driven development uh, kind of says that you just have to go error one step at a time. So now you can see that the import works. Uh, and it says that there is no uh, argument for a vector uh, which is fine because uh, the default uh, class will create an arg uh, will use the self as the argument and just create a simple vector from there so uh, let's see how we can create a vector class and um, solve these errors now i go back here and i say um, um, something about the vector so let me just create a doc string for this so it's like a three element vector used in 3d graphics for multiple purposes the last part for multiple purposes will become clear when we are going to use the vector for storing um, other information like color but uh, for now, this doc string will actually help us to understand what uh, this class stands for. Uh, it's just basic documentation. I'm going to create the constructor in it. Uh, I'm going to say x becomes uh, has a default value of 0, y as well, and z as well. Am I using 0.0, .0 because uh, most of the time we are going to deal with floating point numbers and I want to make sure that it's not stored as integers uh, which Python does convert automatically but more comfortable if it is stored in a way that we can access um, from this uh, which we can define from the start as floating point um, next we just have to save them in our uh, default um, attributes so self.x is x, self.y is y, um, self.z is z. Don't worry about the formatting, it gets automatically fixed. Save as you can see. Um, another good practice is to create a, a string representation uh, so that whenever I want to print uh, a vector, I can see it in a very clear format. So let me define that as well. So that is define str it's a magic or a dunder method um, all i have to do is I have to return a string representation so um, you can use many string representations you can even use the f uh, string representation but um, i'd like to use a little bit uh, older method uh, not the printf string method but the format function so i'll just say uh, it's inside brackets because conventionally vectors are represented inside round brackets as comma separated values. You say format self dot x comma self dot y comma self dot z. So that will be the string representation. Uh, now we'll come to the actual uh, dot product itself. So remember we are implementing the dot product and then implementing the magnitude using that dot product so how do you implement a dot product it's pretty pretty straightforward define dot product which takes self and another vector so um, the common way of naming it is called other and um, what i need to return is basically self dot x multiplied by the other dot x plus self dot y multiplied by the other dot y plus self dot z multiplied by the other dot z it's great so that's pretty much dot product uh, next i would like to define the magnitude so uh, i'm going to use um, the uh, function name as magnitude 
I can spell magnitude. Uh, remember, you don't need any other uh, vector for this. It's just the magnitude of this particular object itself. So I'll return it as the square root. So I need to use the square root function from math. SQRT if I'm not wrong. Self dot dot product of uh, self and self again, right? Yeah. So I think uh, we have uh, a problem here. Oh, okay, we have an imported math. No more red lines. So uh, I think we are good to go for uh, as far as the test passing the test perspective is concerned. Uh, let's see if the test pass now. And as you can see, the tests have passed. Uh, uh, this single dot over here is the number of tests. So uh, that is one of the tests that we are planning to do. The other test is about um, um, addition and uh, normalization, etc. So before that, let's continue. Uh, I'm not going to write all the uh, extensive test cases for testing uh, vector. I'm just going to, you know, continue implementation of the vector class for uh, the sake of time. But uh, you can always write your uh, full set of test cases based on the requirements. Next, I'm going to implement the normalize. So uh, if you remember, normalize requires dividing. So for normalize, we are going to divide the vector by the magnitude of the vector let's do that normalize with a z and then i'm going to return the self divided by the self dot magnitude remember we have not implemented the division operator so this does not work at this point so uh if you go back to our requirements, you can see that we have implemented uh, the magnitude, the normalize and the dot product. And what remains is the basic addition, multiplication, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division operators. Um, before we go into this, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, how we are going to do this as a, an operator overloading. Uh, which is very convenient uh, in Python that you can instead of writing uh, you know just we did for dot product right um, one vector dot dot product open brackets and you know call that for particular function you can just write um, you know something operator something um, as we have done here for addition so how does operator overloading work in Python uh, when we divide a vector with an another vector, as you can see here, uh, if you have defined a true division method uh, with a vector uh, as self and that accepts an another vector as other, uh, you can actually define this particular function, what it should be done. And when you write this in Python code, uh, internally it will call this particular uh, method which is called a double underscore method or dunder method for short so it's actually two underscores over here followed by true div followed by two underscores um, same thing for addition same thing for uh, subtraction so it will be add add uh, if you are doing vector one plus vector two or uh, sub for subtraction if you do vector one subtracted by uh, vector two now uh, uh, let's try to uh, implement that in code um, come back here
again this is uh, quite uh, easy to implement but one thing you have to remember is that you have to create a new vector uh, which takes these arguments so um, you have to be adding self x with the other x comma self y with the other y and self z with the other z right um this is how i would implement the addition operation now how would i test an addition operation so let's open tests at pi and uh, let me say something called define test addition self so uh, i'm going to check um only one of uh so I'm, I'm not going to check whether x equals something uh, the result of an addition y equals something etc i'm just going to check uh say for example sum equals self dot v1 plus self dot v2 so we haven't uh, defined v2 so let's define that self dot v2 equals vector remember it was 0 6.0 0, 0. <clears throat> now um, I'm not going to check whether all the sums are correct but I just want to check if the x value is right so the way I would do that is self assert equal uh, I'll use get attribute of uh, sum and the attribute I want is X and I'll check whether it is equal to 4 right uh, this is much more easier than creating a sum attribute a sum vector which is uh, has to be compared one by one etc um, basically I'm assuming that if the addition worked um, the first component should be correct so let me go back to the shell um, just run the test again so it says it ran two tests and they are all okay. So uh, the addition works. Uh, coming back to our uh, vector class, um, we just need to continue implementing the other function. So it's pretty straightforward when it comes to, sorry, when it comes to subtraction, just to call it sub. You have to subtract everything and you would think to subtraction now what remains is multiplication and division uh, there is a catch when it comes to multiplication and division which i'd like to go a little more detail here so uh, instead of one multiplication operator you might notice that there are two uh, operator overloading options uh, mul and rmul basically multiply and right multiply or left multiply and right multiply however you want to call it um, it doesn't uh, really matter if you if you are multiplying two vectors uh, two class two instances of vectors but it does matter when you are multiplying two different data types for example uh, a vector and a number as we have seen here so uh, if you are having two different uh, data types what python tries to do is it tries to look for a multi and it sees the multiply operator what it tries to do is it tries to call the left hand side's mul multiply operator and if it doesn't find that it goes to the right hand side and does an uh, look for look up for the rmul operator and whichever so in that sequence if the first one fails it tries the second one and uh, whichever works it uh, executes that uh, an easy way to find uh, to understand this in python is if you multiply a string with a number what is actually happening is uh, the number does not have an mul operator which takes a string so it takes uh, the string actually takes 
uh, has an MUL operator which takes a number and it multiplies, uh, it basically repeats the string a number of times. If you reverse the order of operations, uh, operands, um, the number still does not support multiplying uh, a string. So the number does not have an MUL operator which takes a string. So it asks the string whether you have an RML operator. And in the second case, the RML operator gets called and the result is the same. What I want to implement in the vector class is pretty much the same thing. I want uh, whether you multiply a vector with a number um, in, 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 in a left and right or the right and left order, uh, it should actually call the same operation. So um, let's let's implement that. So I'm going to implement uh, I'm going to copy the multi the subtraction, put it here call multiply self other. as simple as that now uh, I want to make sure that I'm not calling uh, a vector to be multiplied with another vector uh, in other words I want to make sure that other is always a number so oh, okay I made that mistake here already so instead of other dot X should just be other and um, since this is a very common mistake I want to add an assert statement here like this which makes sure that it's not it's not instance uh, sorry um, that it's not an instance of vector so if other is a vector this assert fails and it says that you cannot multiply um, you can now implement the RMUL operator because the uh, operation is commutative. You can still um, use the MUL's result for this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to return the MUL's result by just interchanging the arguments. Self dot MUL. Other. And that takes care of multiplication so uh, we kind of uh, implemented multiply here so you can think of a test for that as well test multiplication Uh, what do you expect the multiplication to be 3? The result, the product should be 3 here. To the shell. Um, okay. <laughs> Made a easy mistake there. It should have multiplied by a number. It's the exact sort of problem that we should have caught. So if I multiply 1 with 2, I should get as a result so this is really the reason why I have that assert statement over there great so now we have these three tests as indicated by these three dots and I'm all passed so now um, I'm going to implement the final operation which is division and as you might have expected there is a catch over there as well so uh, like uh, multiplication, we might see two similarly named methods, div and true div. And uh, if you're not familiar with uh, how it is done, uh, you might assume that div is the right uh, uh, division operation to use here. Whereas in fact, it is true div. Um, since we are using Python 3, division uh, uh, a divided by b will call a's uh, operator called a method called true div 
uh, why is it called true div uh, it's easier if you understand python 2's case uh, whereas in python 2 if you call a divided by b it will normally call a dot underscore underscore div rather than true div except when you have used this particular special line which says from future import division in which case if you do the same operation a divided by b it will call a dot underscore underscore true div so uh, the history behind this is that um, when you divided um, two numbers it used to give um, um, somewhat inaccurate results somewhat truncated results it used to always perform integer division uh, unless both are uh, or integers etc um, this was uh, rectified in python 3 but there was already a magic method called div so they called it true div to signify that this is real division this is what is expected and um, true div became the um, you know uh, method that you should implement for division so let's implement true div now if I go back to uh, our vector class you can see that uh, MUL is already implemented so let's use that call it true div this line still stands we need to ensure that the other instance is not a vector and um, we also need to replace this by division um, there is no reverse uh, or r m u uh, r true division uh, because division is not commutative as multiplication we cannot assume that you know uh, a divided by b is same as b divided by a like in multiplication so uh, we don't have to implement that method so that means that basically we are done when it comes to vector class uh, we have implemented a vector class we have implemented some test cases uh, i agree that these test cases are not complete uh, they don't test all of our uh, requirements but uh, i would leave that as an exercise to the reader because um, uh, writing a complete set of test cases sometimes takes as much effort as writing the code itself and uh, if you are creating any non-trivial project it is as important to have a good test coverage of all the lines of your code uh, as writing the code that works itself so congratulations you have reached this far you have uh, implemented the first sub problem of the project